on this episode of Skeptico, a show about near-death experience. One of the interesting things is that when people are told, it's not your time, you have things to do, work to do. It's interesting that they're not told what it is. And a show about the clarity that can come from making tough decisions. So, what can I do for you? I want out. I'm done. I want out. When did you start feeling so sorry for yourself? It's unbearable. It's just money. It's not wrong. And it's certainly no different today than it's ever been. Stick around for my interview with near-death experience researcher, author, and hedge fund manager and trader, DJ Kadajian. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris, and today we welcome DJ Kadajian to Skeptico to talk about his new book, The Crossover Experience, a book he wrote with two very highly regarded, at least in my opinion, near-death experience researchers, Dr. Penn Van Lamel and Dr. Gregory Shushan, both of whom you've heard on this show, and uh, they're really terrific. First, uh, let's give a little bit of a bio for DJ, award-winning documentary filmmaker, best-selling author, quantum economist. I think that's code speak for hedge fund manager and trader. <laughs> Can you say it that way? <laughs> Instead of hedge fund that has bad kind of now. It wow. does. It does. But it plays so beautifully into this terrific book that you've written, DJ, that I want to push it out there in front. Hedge fund manager, <laughs> quantum yeah. economist, cracking the code of the yeah. scientific wrinkle. There's a lot. There's a lot to unpack yeah, there, my man. Yeah. Kind of scary. Don't know how it all <laughs> came together, but as much as it is, yeah, that's a little bit of me. So uh, DJ's films have aired on PBS, Gaia TV, Discovery Channel, Hallmark, as well as well as being in over 120 film festivals. He's a Cornell man and a member of the Directors Guild. And it's great to have you here, DJ. Thanks for joining me. Great to be here. I've enjoyed watching, uh, listening to your podcast as well. And in fact, I stumbled on your podcast with uh, him uh, Boy, about a year ago and um, i've read a lot that's on your site and um so it's nice, very nice to be here well terrific you just mentioned pim van lamel and mm -hmm. dr gregory shushan is the other near-death experience researcher that a lot of people will know they're featured prominently in this book we're going to talk about the book it's really quite unique and i think will be highly useful for a lot of people the way that you've put this together but first maybe talk about who these guys are let's introduce them a little bit because they are along for the ride on this book and are a prominent part of it well uh dr von lamel was uh, is was a uh, practicing cardiologist in the netherlands and he was he kind of stumbled on the near-death experience right around the same time as uh raymond moody did so they were kind of both in two separate parts of the world, but as often happens, you know, these things kind of kick up at the same time. And, uh, but let's tell the story because it's such a great story because it's interesting you draw the connection with Raymond Moody because they really stumble upon it in a mm -hmm. completely different way. Mm -hmm. I mean, Raymond Moody, a lot of people don't know, but he's with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross is how he mm -hmm. stumbles on it. She's mm -hmm. really the one who kind of discovers it and she says, Raymond, you better come over and look at this. Pin Van Lamel stumbles on it in a very experient, indirect experiential way. T mm -hmm. Tell that story. Well, he just, he had a patient that uh, had come out of one of his surgeries and told him, you know, essentially that he saw things that were happening in the operating room. And, uh, and Pim was pretty much astonished because it was accurate. And, and we've heard this now. I mean, this has been recorded often, but back then it wasn't as common. And at the time, really, this is when we were first starting to see having the ability to bring pa uh, people back from cardiac arrest prior to um, the resuscitation techniques. You really couldn't do that. And 
Um, and now they were starting to bring people back. So this started to happen and he happened to experience one firsthand and he was blown away. And so he started asking around to other doctors, cardiologists, if they had had that type of experience with, with some of their patients. And they said, yes, we did, but they had all written it off or like, this can't be. But so he kept asking around and starting to put the pieces of the puzzle together and see that there was uh, uh, very, um, there was great consistency in, in what people were saying, and, but most weren't taking it seriously, but he had started going around and kind of, you know, kicking the tires. And, and that's when he really started to say, you know, something is definitely going on here. And that's really when he started to dive into the work and ultimately leading to what I think is probably, well, I would consider it the most important study, research study done on the subject. A prospective study was published in the Lancet Journal, um, really, really thorough and um, um, just really well-researched and articulated. And, and his book, Consciousness Beyond Life, was when I really got into this for the second time, because I initially um, kind of came onto the subject of the near-death experience, you know, well over 20 years ago when I was kind of going through a, um, you know, a spiritual quest that took me into, uh, you know, death and dying and, and these uh, sorts of things, a dependent book of the dead. And somehow I stumbled on Raymond Moody's book. Um, and, and not to disparage Raymond Moody's book, which is mind blowing, but I really, I connected more with uh, Dr. Van Lommel's book because um, he laid it out um, when he brought in really his interpretation of quantum mechanics, um, which helped tie everything together. You know, the testimonials uh, that he had gathered individually, his research uh, study, and then kind of tying the pieces together with quantum mechanics. It was like, you know, it just, you could really see kind of all these patterns. Um, for me, they just started to distill. And so, you know, my background in uh, quantum mechanics uh, and hedge fund management is to really look at and crunch, you know, massive amounts of data and looking for patterns and rhythms and waves. And really that's how the markets work. I mean, ultimately it's, it's actually very interesting. And in a way it's much uh, simpler than it's discussed oftentimes on CNBC. And it's all, it's all really a reflection of human emotion and waves and patterns and energy. And so you start to see these things come together and, and Pim Van Lama was seeing them on the ground in real time, you know, these out of body experience. And I think the way he uh, really covers um, non-local consciousness, um, that, that's really, you know, ex extremely, it just makes a lot of sense. There's so much, uh, data that backs this up. And I went through thousands of testimonials and the patterns are incredibly consistent. So anyway, that's, that's where I kind of really fell in love with, you know, Pim's work and also really listening to his lectures. Um, the one, the podcast that you did with him and uh, he's done, he's done obviously a lot of uh, interviews you'll find on, on YouTube and they weren't, these things weren't around when I was, they were happening when I first started looking at the near-death experience, but I, I really didn't have access to them other than a few books. So when you start to watch these, I watch probably as much of these types of, uh, you know, his types of interviews um, from the research quantum standpoint, um, as I did the actual testimonials, which also blew me away. But uh, so anyway, that's Pim's work, which, uh, which really influenced me a lot. So it was just incredible, really great to have him as part of the book. That meant a lot. So let's pause there for a second, because, you know, I, I don't know how much you want to go into this, but you do touch on it a couple of times in the book. So I think it's fair to bring it up. I mean, part of your personal journey is kind of death and dying in kind of a tragic way and, you know, personal way and that plays into that. So how is that part of your spiritual journey that you do allude to in the book? For me personally, you know, I grew up in, in I guess you would call it a kind of a war zone, meant a psychological war zone, you know, kind of physical abuse kind of stuff where you, you really feel like, you know, in, in these situations when you, you know, when I was very young, like, like you're going to die. You feel like, you know, you, you are in a place where you could die at any time. So, you know, I had a lot of fear of death when I was, you know, I didn't know that growing up, but as I became older, you know, serious PTSD 
And, and, you know, I, I sensed this real fear. And I think that's why I was drawn to, you know, initially Joseph Campbell, I, I stumbled on his uh, interview with Bill Moyers on PBS. I don't know how I found it, but really I started listening to that and it was like, phew, my mind exploded. And that for me started the whole kind of spiritual quest. And then, uh, you know, and he deals so much with, you know, mythology, mythic imagery. He was, he was a contemporary and a friend with Carl Jung and, you know, his whole world. And, uh, and then I got uh, stumbled on uh, Houston Smith's interview with, uh, he also did a series with Bill Moyers called uh, Wisdom of Faith. And he spent um, something like five years in each of the world's major religions. And that really blew me away. So it kind of pulled everything together. And once that happened, I had my own investment firm and once that happened, I, I said, you know, I don't know that I can do this really anymore full time for sure. So it was around that time. Uh, first, I said, you know what, I'm going to try and go to divinity school kind of on the side. And um, so I started going to um, Yale Divinity School, which is not that far from where I was living. And, and uh, it, was, <laughs> it was not a good time. It was not the kind of environment I was looking for. It was very, not very spiritual, which is, you know, I, I thought it would be you know, very intellectually stimulating, but also spiritually, and it wasn't that at all. Um, and I remember I had my, uh, I had a report due, and I hadn't, I'm, I'm not good in school, I was never a good student. But I remember being down in Miami, and, and, and I'm like, oh my god, I have to do a book report. And I was so freaked out by that concept that I immediately dropped out. <laughs> that was it. So that was my religious career. Um, I always told my hat, my, my wife, I was in it for the hat. You know, I wanted the hat and the scepter, whatever the Pope carries. But of course, it was uh, it was not a Catholic uh, school. So that was never going to happen anyway. So that was that. Um, but so that kind of drove me, uh, you know, of course, and I, I, I found I, I became very interested in Buddhism, Four Noble Truths, um, the whole concept of, you know, dying, you know, the ego death and, and so on. And just you know, it really um, resonated with me in a, in a way because that had always been floating, the concept. But for me, it was much more literal death, not knowing that, you know, it's all spiritual and it's, it's all kind of this, in a, in a sense, all the same. We just maybe um, experience it a little differently if depending on where we are on our journey or, you know, how open we are to these kinds of things. And, and that was around that time that I also stumbled on the work of Raymond Moody. I'm not sure how that got mixed up in all of it. I found it fascinating, but at the time there wasn't a lot of research um, where I could, you know, to me, it was like, wow, this is really amazing, but, and it sounds too good to be true in a way. And so I'm, I'm a skeptic, skeptico. And uh, so I'm, you know, I said, fine, but I need to see, you know, more research. And it just didn't exist in a, in a way that I could find it. And there was, there was no real YouTube at that point. This is like 25 years ago. Um, so I, I moved off and on from that and uh, started getting into film work where I, I just said, you know what, I, instead of going to divinity school and reading books, I'm not really interested in. I said, no, I'm going to start interviewing people that I'm, I've read their books and I'm very interested in, I want to go to the source and ask them questions, you know, so something like this where it's interactive and, you know, you just, I, I learn much more that way, having conversations and building things like building a film, building a program. It's having something at the end of the day that forces you to form an opinion. And uh, so I started interviewing, well, uh, Houston Smith was in my first film, which was, which was a real treat. And uh, anyway, a number of, of these people. Um, but I, I, you know, and then I had, somehow I stumbled on the work of Terrence McKenna. Uh, that led me into the whole psychedelic kind of movement. And uh, so I kind of traveled a whole lot of, you know, maybe on the, the fringe crossing over all different types of, you know, um, realms and realities and and along the way i just kind of started i became i i articulated them i guess in some of the film work i did where my films um, are very experiential uh where i add a lot of music and imagery to what i'm doing i have a very non-linear way of thinking 
um, massive dyslexia. And, um, and I think one of the reasons I had success in finance is especially creating programs, it's very nonlinear. And that's how my brain works. Like, like I was uh, late on getting on this call. I can't remember what zip code I'm in. <laughs> I like, I have trouble, you know, you know, I lose my, I, it's just, it's crazy the way my life works, but I, I do have some uh, ability to do kind of out of the box things just because my brain is somewhat shattered, maybe in a good way. DJ again, and you don't have to answer this, but, and uh, you and your wife lost your son. Yeah. Yeah. That, um, that was almost two years ago, about a year and a half ago. And I think, you know, the, the, like, I'd like to know how that, well, I'd like to know to the extent that you feel it's uh, relevant or interesting to, uh, to play into this, because this is this larger stream of consciousness that we're all tapping into in different ways. And like one of my friends of the show and friend, Mark Ireland, lost a son, and that's what kind of propelled him into looking into the near-death experience stuff. But then he found in his background that he had kind of been primed for it in a way, in some major ways, in terms of his father was like super psychic, his uncle was super psychic and all the rest of this. And they were immediately connecting with the other side. And so I think it's kind of interesting in a way that you were primed, you know, you were primed yeah. for, uh, uh, you know, and then all the things we have to deal with that in terms of, I mean, that's so personal, you know, that's so personal, but at the same time, it is the essence of this thing that we're talking about with the near-death experience and the scientific wrinkle and the look behind the curtain and all this other stuff that we might think about in a much, much deeper way than most people are talking about. So I don't want you to share any more than, uh, than we need to or you need to. And if you want, we can take all that out. But, you know, how, how does this all fit together in terms of when you look at life and death and the people who are closest to us and the people, you know, your kids, I got four kids. It's like, I tell my kids, you know, I said, look, you don't get this, but you have a piece of my heart. You got it. I mean, I can't do anything with it other than sit back and go, oh my God, be really careful with it. Cause there's nothing I can do. You own it. I, I, I don't longer have it, you know? So I don't know. Yeah, it was, um, it was, uh, it's been interesting. It, ha uh, my son passed about two years ago. It was when COVID hit and my, he, he came to the area, Sarasota. I live on Longbow Key, which is right off Sarasota. And he, um, he'd been struggling with uh, addiction for boy about 10 years. And um, he'd been going back and, you know, back and forth going down to like Peru and um, he was getting, you know, treatments for, you know, using which, which now we're, we're seeing this happen all around, all around the world now where they're using psychedelics in, in therapy. It's becoming more prevalent, whether it's psilocybin, uh, well, MDMA, which is not really psychedelic, but Ibogaine, uh, which, uh, which he, he, he did once that's pretty brutal stuff and uh, that had major impact on him it really helped him for a long time so he was down there he, he studied to become a shaman for a while really interesting kid you know he's really he was really talented poet you know the, the whole thing so he got here he didn't really know anybody and then COVID hit and uh, you know he, he couldn't get work he isolated a little bit too much and um and it just bang it just happened and you know we had been living with that fear for so long so i had a sense always that it was going to happen there were two times where he probably should have uh well he should have passed and and twice he had you know somebody saw and they got a narcon kit there and brought him back so he's been he's been on both sides a few times but so, yeah, that happened and it just blew my mind. I mean, it just blew me out of the water. And there was so much going on at the same time between, you know, COVID and, you know, my world of, you know, the way I trade and trying to hold everything together at once. And, uh, you know, I just had a, you know, I had kind of a bit of a meltdown 
so I was, uh, again, also because of the way I grew up, so, you know, for whatever reason, it, it hit me, you know, maybe it, everybody processes it differently, but it hit me insanely hard. And I was, you know, pretty much bedridden for a long time and uh, despondent. And, and one day my wife came up to me and she gave me this workbook. And, uh, you know, I was, my, my whole philosophy was if I woke up, I would take I forget, I'm a pretty healthy person, but she, I would take Zequel and it would like knock me out. And if I woke up just to distract my brain, I would watch Liverpool soccer. And so, but, but at the time they weren't playing any, you know, live games. So I watched the same three games for like three or four months. And it was, just, I knew every shot. I knew every, the good thing is they always won in these games and my teams on the New York sports fan, they always lose. So in that sense, it was fantastic. So a little sidetrack there, but uh, no, not 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 really. You know, for someone, for someone who still watches uh, on YouTube, LSU uh, 2019, Joe Burrow. You know, <laughs> I could yeah. tell you. You know, but yeah. uh, you know, it's it's in a way that's it's going to link up with what we're talking about here in a very strange way, and I think you and I link up in some interesting ways in terms of the perspective we bring to this, and it, it will come back into play, folks. I guarantee you, but we won't go down that too much further. Let's switch back and talk about your other uh, contributing author to this, Dr. Gregory Shushan. Give us a little bit of a background on who he is. Sure. Uh, well, Gregory is, uh, he is uh, an academic uh, PhD and his, uh, his background really is his some of his lectures and the uh, interview you did with him i mean kind of must read um stuff it can get pretty heady his books are, are pretty difficult to read sometimes when he when he speaks and and the way he wrote in this book it's a little more hands on but he looks at the near death experience over time and through different culture uh and and you know the similarities how they're interpreted uh differently but in a sense they're all the same um you know based on you know, where a person comes from, the, uh, the stories they were told, uh, the, the myths that they learned, whether it was, um, you know, Parsifal or Star Wars kinds of things, and how ultimately they're, they're so similar. Um, and let me just interject, DJ, because your book does a, a great job of that. Again, the book is The Crossover Experience. You want to check it out. Like, it's, it's worth the price. And if you have Kindle Unlimited, the price is zero. But even if you don't, it's a very, very affordable book just to read the thought process of Dr. Gregory Shushan. And as you said, academic researcher, we already know that if you want to, if you observe a phenomenon like near-death experience and you have any sort of broader mind and it goes towards anthropology and sociology, one of the things you want to do is start looking at cross culture, cross time, because then a lot of things fall away and you go, oh, that's just something that we cooked up in our culture. When you start seeing it across time, cross culture, then you go, aha, there's something more to this. His aha goes one step further, which you were just alluding to. He said, you know what? I can definitely trace how these different cultures with different religious traditions shifted after the near-death experience entered into their culture. So, you know, you're this Polynesian village and you got your gods and you got this and suddenly Bobo over there has a near-death experience and he comes back and now your religious traditions about death and dying, they change. And the only thing that as an anthropologist sociologists, the only thing you could say is something about that guy's experience was so compelling that it changed. And then when you find that over and over and over again around the world across hundreds of different years, he just does the solid scientific work and say, well, we can only conclude that these near-death experiences were extremely profound in forming their beliefs about the afterlife. And I think that's phenomenal. And I, I would also maybe tie it back to this book that you've, uh, that you've written and compiled, because one of the things I really think is great about the book, and it ties back to the skeptic part that you're saying, and also the 
hate to say it, the hedge fund trader part, because you mentioned a minute ago that you're a skeptic. And like, I'm a skeptic, but like, I'm not really a skeptic, you know? Right. And I would suspect that Dr. Pin Von Lommel, he, he's a skeptic, but in a good way, he's not really a skeptic because everyone else, again, like the story you tell, I mean, that guy dies on the table and he's experienced death over and over again. He's a cardiologist, like people die every day in front of Pin Von Lommel. So when this guy comes back and says, hey, Pim, uh, what's going on? Why are you making that joke? And he goes, what do you mean? You're dead. I know what dead means. Your heart had stopped. Your brain had stopped. It was two minutes after. They were flatlined. We were monitoring everything. Oh, no, I was there. The, the skeptic in the bad sense that we're used to is all his colleagues who he talks to and go, no, uh, don't, don't process that in that way. That ain't going to be good for everything that I want. The person who is ready, either because of 10 past lives or just because they're open-minded or whatever, says, no, this is something I need to look into. And so when you say you're a skeptic, you know, I guess I'd say like the thing I think is interesting about the hedge fund manager is, oh, come on, DJ, you know, that doesn't work. You can't write a trading program that beats the market, the market. It's a random walk that doesn't work. What would you tell somebody who, who had that belief about the market and about trading programs and about hedge fund craziness? you know there's more going on and uh well, I, I let me interject because it was a lead-up question <laughs> i'd say look at my freaking house pal look at yeah. my bank account it kind of tells a different story but if that's what you want to believe hey i wish you the best of luck yeah it's uh it's interesting and and i think that was so helpful for me when i really started really going into the near-death experience was having the experience i had uh in the markets because it's not random even though people think it is, they see volatility and it looks random. But if you look at a chart, you know, a graph of what the markets have done, uh, it's fascinating. Patterns that you'll see uh, within a day, uh, within an hour, but within a day, you'll see a similar pattern over a period of a week and over a month and over 10 years and over 100 years. These are, these are very consistent patterns. You can't always capitalize on them because they are somewhat random and people try to trade the, the patterns that are obvious. But then if you dig a little bit deeper, then there are things that start to happen that are not as random. They're harder to find, but ultimately they're going to be there because all of this, these charts and you know, lines and, and what have you that start to form these patterns. And visually, you can, I can show somebody this and they'll say, wow, it's really there. It doesn't go away. And it More than visually, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I read this in your thing not only can you show it to them visually, but you can show that to them statistically, you can say yes. there is a correlation here, here it is. Yeah. Well, you know, I just say, you know, I track my numbers. And so if, if I'm going to talk to somebody and perhaps, you know, manage uh, funds for them, you know, here's, here's my account. I show my literal account and uh, you know, I'm not taking new assets. So I <laughs> I'm not trying to brag, but but I've been doing over 40% a year in my most recent program over the last, uh, since 2011. And um, I trade, I'm a true hedge fund. Most hedge funds don't hedge positions. They're long. They're all long the same thing. These hedge funds are so large right now. But I, I trade more commodities than stocks. And so a barrel of oil, a bar of gold, and a bond, treasury bond. And these things are, are much more pure you know, a, a barrel of oil has been a barrel of oil a hundred years. Nobody can, you know, tell you it's going to earn this much more, you know, here or there. Same with gold. It just is what it is. And so they have even more pure motion than stocks. Stocks have so many things going on under the surface and so much misdirection, whether it's by the CEO or the analysts or the sell side that's, you know, floating a new IPO for them. When you start to get into something like, like gold, for example, uh, and oil, the, the patterns, you can start to see other types of uh, more consistent patterns, not over the short term, but, but it's all emotion. It's all human emotion. I mean, the price over 20 years might go up, but all the stuff that's going on to get you there, these patterns, you don't go straight. Those patterns are all based on emotion. So it's, it's, it's fascinating. And that can be applied 
I found that uh, so applicable to what I started to see in the near-death experience when I started crunching those numbers. And that really blew me away. Uh, that blew me away because it's clear when you go through them. And if you have an eye for looking at those types of things, and I'm not talking about crunching statistics in the way that like, in my opinion, the guys like Pim Van Lommel, um, you know, Peter Fenwick early on, Raymond Moody, you know, they, they did the numbers. And, and one of the things I say in the book, which people could take offense to, is that everything we've learned about the near-death experience, we really learned it, you know, 40 years ago. You know, the major uh, themes within a, a near-death experience, you know, the out-of-body experience, the tunnel, going into the light, the life review, et cetera. Nothing has changed in those stories over the last 40 plus years. And we're getting so many of them, obviously, since uh, the 60s with ever since we saw resuscitation techniques, because now you're talking about thousands of people that have had these near-death experiences. Which in and of itself, though, I mean, there's, there's so much to deconstruct there that I don't want to go too far down that because that raises the whole question of the scientific wrinkle thing, you know, mm -hmm. like is science somehow driving this, you know, is God driving this? What are the patterns and all the rest of it? What, what we're really highlighting, and I think you did an awesome job of explaining is you are bringing a different perspective to this. It comes through in the book. Let me dip into this into the book a little bit and talk about it so that people get, I keep saying it's different, it's unique, and it's very cool. What you've done here is you've, again, is this hedge fund trader who's looking for patterns, you look through thousands of near-death experiences and yes. you pulled out these patterns and some of them are, will be very familiar to us, you know, out of body experience, tunnel into the light, hellish. I love that you have hellish in there. Cause that's something that people immediately are drawn to. And we'll talk about that. Um, mm -hmm. life review, all these things. And then for each one of those, what people can do is they can go in there and you've called out little snippets of these experiences because when it comes to near-death experiences we all want to hear the stories and mm -hmm. you do that you provide kind of some of the most meaningful parts of these different stories but then what you do is two really cool things you summarize for us some of the most i guess bullet points of that you know the life review what you'll hear consistently. You give us some statistics with even some nice graphics that says, this is what you'll find there. And then you have this wonderful commentary where you, Dr. Pin Van Lommel and Dr. Gregory Shushan are each offering their perspective. And it, it turns out to be quite a unique, in a lot of cases, perspective about the tunnel, about the life review, about all these things. So this is something I think people you know, even people who are familiar or think they're familiar with the near-death experience, they'll really find a fresh kind of way of pulling this apart and looking at it. So you're really to be credited with, uh, with this unique approach that you've taken. What, what, are, what are people saying? Are people getting this? Are people responding to this kind of thing? You know, it's, um, what's interesting is the people that have read it that I've that I've spoken to or the reviews that I've read, um, they're they're looking at it. Well, so many of them have never have not read anything about the near death experience, so it's it's kind of their introduction into it, and they like the format. It is different, but I you know I'm I'm just starting to hear. I'm trying to, you know, I'm interested in the contrast because I did want to create something. I wanted to create something that I would wanted to read. That's what I always do with a film. So, and it doesn't always, isn't always um, the best seller because I pick topics that are sometimes, you know, difficult, especially I've, I've done them on capitalism, greed, racism, things like that. And I do them in a style that's, so, I don't want to say in your face, but is somewhat provocative. And I, I feel like, uh, I feel like that the, with a certain uh, NDE crowd may not like it because some of the things that I unearthed in, in what I was looking at are hard to explain and haven't been expressed before and aren't very comforting in a way, although I think there's more to it. There's something behind it, but 
I was very surprised after reading so many of these that there were just, you know, a few things where it's like, wow, haven't, how come I've never heard that? Because they're big things. And one example would be um, how I never heard of any of, and I, in this book, I was very careful because I've read a lot of books where they say that the person uh, was dead, but I really stayed with people that were clinically dead and that it happened either in a hospital setting or if it were outside of a hospital, it was somebody that either had uh, medical experience or it was an EMT. So I really only wanted that because that's where, you know, I'm not discounting any other kind of near-death experience, but as a, as a massive skeptic, I really wanted to stick with, I really wanted to skew the odds in my favor in the sense that this is um, very hard to, to um, you know, to knock down, you know, the kind of research and statistics I was able to come out with, which is as an interesting example in reading so many of these, I, I never heard of anyone say they saw their wife on the other side. They saw relatives. And now a lot of these people obviously are older, so they've had a, a spouse predecease them. And so how is that possible? I'm not talking, I saw one or two, or I saw, you know, 3% had them. I'm talking going through thousands of these and I never saw one. How is that possible? I didn't see anybody that had pets. Now I've heard of them, but I went through thousands of these and I never saw them. I think that there's something, you know, more, obviously um, a lot of these people spoke of kind of traveling in the spiritual pack that they go through these lifetimes with. So obviously if we're, you know, living with, if we're married to, if we're that connected, we have a spouse that's, you know, and, and we're part of this group that's still going to happen. Because in a lot of cases, they say, if you go beyond this point, you can't come back. Well, obviously, they never went beyond that point or they wouldn't have come back. But my guess is that that's in the beyond. You can't can't convince me otherwise. But the fact of the matter is no one even broaches that subject and it's there. Now, I think it's it's I think the explanation is beyond, you know, if you if you go beyond that, it's on the other side of that bridge, which people often run into. But how come we haven't discussed that? That's interesting to me. And that's, these are the little things that I really love going through because I, I look at the little things help you to flesh out something I believe is, is, is more, you know, it's, it's more organic, earthy, totally. more full, rich, uh, confusing, confounding, interesting, mind blowing. You know, that's the kind of stuff I like to see. Totally. And I think that, you know, there's a couple points too, and I can go all skeptical on you here in a minute as well. But <laughs> I, I think, again, to me, that's the hedge fund trader, you know, because people, I haven't traded a lot, but I trade enough and I manage enough assets enough that there's a certain clarity that comes with money, especially large amounts of money that you just can't get anywhere else because everyone in the world is so consumed with that. And when you master that to some degree, there is a great feeling of control about that. And I think it, it comes through to me in that you can be matter of fact in, in a way that a lot of people just can't handle. You're like, no, I did my work. I'm making the trade. You know, that's mm -hmm. the guy because that's the guy like I'm sure you could tell a million stories and it's off topic. But, you know, guys who can't pull the trigger, they do all the analysis and then they're like, yeah, but. Uh, and and by the, the way, that's why because uh, I couldn't. I'm too emotional. And so I knew that the and I what happened is and this is another story I, I was saying I was going to tell you, which I, I can explain when my son died, she put a book in front of me, my wife, and that opened me back up to the NDE and that just where it started blowing my mind. Well, when I was younger and I, I was already in the business, um, but I was you know, taking uh, research from the analysts and so forth, my wife put in front of me a book called The Market Wizards and it was interviews with top traders in the world. And these guys, when you read it, all were insanely disciplined and they could pull the trigger. And I knew I couldn't, but I could do the research and I could create a program that forced me to pull the trigger. So that remove, even though I'll sit there like with white knuckles, please don't do this trade now. But it's when it's so painful that that's the time to do it. And so I have taken that out of the equation. And so I, that, which is what I also try to bring to the near death experience, because you could get so 
excited about the whole thing blows your mind. And then it's like, yeah, but like, but, all right, let's just look at these little, little gems here that I, I'm interested in that stuff. That's really cool. Well, and the way that plays out, and if we have time, we'll talk about it is, so you, you bring a great perspective to the near death experience, as you talk about at the end of the book in terms of how this stuff has changed you, and it includes some great stories. And I'm going to read a couple clips, a couple of those stories, because they also link back to this thing of kind of in your face hard reality, but this is just the truth, I got to tell it kind of thing. Some of these stories aren't going to be super comforting to people, but they are the stories as they exist. You talk about how a near-death experience can change you even if you haven't had a near-death experience because you haven't had a near-death experience. Interestingly right. enough, neither has your other two co-authors, Dr. Pin Van Lamel or Dr. Gregory Shushan. Neither one has had a near-death experience. All have been deeply affected by the experience. Mm -hmm. no that's doubt. fantastic. That's, yeah. that's like in some ways, that's more important because most of us have not had a near-death experience, but we can yeah. gain so much, but we have so to be much. careful. We have to be careful how we do it. And I think you're providing us some ways to do it. And I would suggest also that you, you are making the trade, you know, you are making the trade. You're just, the program is guiding you. And the reason right. I relate that back is like Dr. Gregory Shushan, I love Gregory Shushan, I think his work is great, but he's this like strident agnostic, you know, it reminds me of that South Park episode, if anyone's ever seen it, you know, the, the agnostic, and it's this militant agnostic foster dad, and Kenny somehow winds up and he goes over to the refrigerator, he goes, this is a refrigerator, you will only drink agnostic soda, that means Dr. Pepper or Diet Dr. Pepper, we do <laughs> not know the flavor of Dr. Pepper, is it a root beer, is it a cola, no one knows, it can't be known. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's hilarious how much he's into, you know. And so Gregory Shushan, to me, goes through this tortured explanation of why he has to remain agnostic about near-death experience. And you want to go, Gregory, first of all, when it comes to the fundamental questions in life, no one is agnostic because your life is not agnostic. You mm -hmm. get up every day and you live your life. You've already made the decision. Someone just has to look at your life and go, oh, that's what you choose. You choose to understand that there is more to life. Or you yeah. look at someone else, you go, no, you're definitely choosing that there is the, nothing more to life. There is no agnosticism when it comes, when it comes to uh, yeah. some of these big questions. What's that saying? There, there are no something in foxholes. I forget that saying. Right. There's no atheists in foxholes. Right. I think. <laughs> but the other thing is, and here's my take on on things like that is, Gregory's put so much work into this topic. I mean, the research is mind blowing. Look at one of his books, and you know, it would take you weeks to read through the uh, the bibliography, and and it, it's incredible. Yeah, and, and part of that tips the hand for him in that, you know, he's done a number of these books now. You could not put that kind of time into a book unless you were passionate about it. And, you know, you can't get up in the morning every day and do that kind of work that hard. If, if inside of you, you know, you didn't think, hey, man, this is, you know, this is happening. You know, I may not say it because I'm a massive skeptic. But you can't get a, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of work to do even, you know, any book, but, but he's done how many in the lectures he's given. So he's at some level, man, you can't tell me, you know, and he's too nice and calm and mellow too and happy. And you right. I mean, the people that I've, uh, well, that I watched, you know, the interviews you do with people, I mean, you saw it with Pim Van Lamo. I mean, this guy's just, you know, he's so, he's, you can't tell him otherwise, just like people that have had it. You'll never convince them otherwise. Once you feel that, and as someone who had a massive fear of death, it's wild how it's just, you know, and I'm not, I mean, I would, everybody knows I'm an open book. It's changed. It's just totally changed because, you know, I saw it happen with my trading programs. There's much more going on. It's energy, it's emotion, it's that. And then you see these kinds of things when you discuss, you know, back, you know, in prehistoric days when Joe, the, you know, who discovered the wheel comes out of this cave and had a near death experience. And all of a sudden now they have this, 
this thing. Well, this wasn't, you know, in most cases, I'm sure this is not the uh, medicine man that had it. It's somebody random. Now, who's going to believe somebody random because they have such uh, conviction? You can see it in their face. You can hear it in the inflection in their voice. You know, uh, they tell the same. It's you can't, you know, you're like, dude, okay, man. I mean, you know, I believe it. And then boom. But, but tricky, GJ, because that's that's partially where you're coming from. That's not it, all the way where you're coming from, because you're still looking through the data. You're still combing through the data. Yeah. And in that sense, you are a skeptic. You know, the, the, my ethos motto on Skeptico is inquiry to perpetuate doubt. You know, whenever we settle on something, then the, yeah. the, 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 the true spirituality is in the doubt in the quest. So I'm going to give you a little hack here that kind of contradicts what you said earlier, but I've shared it on the show before, but I did it right real time while you did that. If you go to nderf.org, which That's is cool. Jeff. Yeah, Jeff, Jeffrey Long and, and So just do, do the so Google much. search. Yeah. Do the Google search NDE, uh, nderf.org mm -hmm. wife, husband, mm -hmm. and you'll find a bunch of near-death experiences where they go, my wife was there, my wife pulled me over here, my wife did this, my first wife, some will say my first wife, and and this and that. So I, I do think that is out there. It, you might be onto something in terms of how prominent it is, and, and we can do that, uh, go down that whole path. But if I can, I want to kind of swing back, because I, I, I love the stories in the book, the snippets, and I want to share a couple especially this one, because it highlights this point, again, back to this soulful hedge fund trader. Everyone thinks mm. hedge fund traders are soulless. We have a soulful <laughs> hedge fund trader. And I was mentioning that the near the end of the book, they have a chapter, a great chapter, how this has changed me. Mm -hmm. And here's one of the stories from one of the contributors, people, someone who's had a near-death experience. I lost connection with all my friends. I was unable to do the social interactions that I used to do. Communication dropped off completely. I was in my own little world trying to put the pieces of the puzzle back together. I resigned from my career as a, in financial technology. I dropped all communication with my coworkers. I read books all day long. I learned about crystals and how to create pyramids. Today, I'm an artist. My relationship with my wife is on thin ice. That part has been sad. I hope it works out. <laughs> she sees a totally different person. She's right. Let me read one more, even more kind of startling in a way. During my first year, I tried to forget what I had seen. Sometimes I tried to drink it away, but that just seemed to make it worse and more vivid. I stopped drinking or taking anything stronger than aspirin, and then I started to feel peace again with my memory of it. I didn't pull it in there, but in that one, she goes, I immediately divorced my husband. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a lot of that. This relates to a couple points. One is the uh, integration problem that... Mm -hmm. You know, we we are sometimes uncomfortable talking about when we really get into, and that's what this book is is, is fearless about. Is like saying, "Hey, we don't know exactly what this means, but I'm going to put it all on the table from a different bunch of different perspectives: medical, anthropological, and just kind of a hard ass. You know, analyze this quantum economist kind of way." I'm going to look at it all these ways, but it still isn't exactly going to make sense. And moreover, it might scare the crap out of you because if someone offers you today, okay, you can lose everything. You can lose all your friends. You can lose your relationship with your spouse. You can lose all this stuff, but it's going to be the greatest thing in your life. You'll say that, you know, a lot of us would pull up and go, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Tell me why I would want to do that. So talk about, your decision to kind of just lay it on the line. And I, I don't want to skew things because the book for the most part, you know, 90% is extremely, extremely positive and uplifting. And it's because near death experience is about our ultimate connection with the light, with love, with God about making life more meaningful. But also let's talk about this part because you're willing to go there in terms of it's not perfect and we don't really understand what it means and it still presents a huge challenge which i think you shared so beautifully at the beginning this doesn't mean that your life is solved that all your problems what you perceive as your problems 
are over. Talk about some of that stuff, TJ. Well, <clears throat> I think one of the interesting things is that when people are told um, you are, it's not your time, you know, you have, you have things to do, work to do. It's interesting that they don't, that they're not told what it is. And a lot of people come back and they're confused. They know that they have, they have a purpose. They're incredibly fired up, um, but they don't know what that purpose is. And I think that's important because it's in that struggle uh, to figure it out that it's in, whatever it is, it's very, very important. There's a reason you came back, but what is it? You know, and so there's, you know, a lot of people come back and, and, you know, they're, they don't tell others. They may not tell them for 10, 20 years. They, some that don't even tell their, their spouse, their friends. I mean, I know that, you know, writing this book, I really don't discuss it with friends because I'm, I mean, I've been involved in so many out there projects. So, you know, they kind of roll their eyes with most things that I do. So I can get away with some of this stuff. But a lot of people, you know, they're, they're extremely uncomfortable and, you know, they come back with many, many more questions than, uh, than answers, but the answers that they experienced there were so profound that, you know, you, you can't, you know, it's once you've, once you've seen, once you've seen something like that, you know, how can, how can you go back to what you were, where you were? So that's, um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but in, in terms of, you know, what I was trying to do f for the, for the reader is what I've always tried to do for myself, because I try to build things that I'm inspired by that challenge me. And so, so in this book, just like in the films I've been doing for 20 years now, it's all about challenging, provoking, and inspiring. So kind of the three where you say, Hey, you know, what is this? And then provoke like, well, it's not maybe what you think. The, the point isn't like Joseph Campbell says, is not in learning the answers to the questions. It's in learning how to ask the right questions. And so this whole thing is, look, I, this is my interpretation, but my interpretation, okay, I, I'm in with the tunnel. Tunnel makes sense to me. They don't, you know, different people describe it differently. Nobody touches things most of the time. These are like the things that I find fascinating, the little, little details. But in Japan, you're going to see more of a cave. The American Indian, it, it was more of a river in a canoe. So there, there, you know, it's a, uh, is it, and that's the thing, how much of what we're seeing is metaphor, but, you know, a lot of people hear that word and it's a little bit charged and they say, well, metaphor, it's not real. It's mythic. It's whatever it is. It's misinterpreted. I mean, a metaphor is much, much more, it's much more true than the truth that we understand. It can talk to people at different levels and it can express the same thing to people of different cultures. And so the thing is, I'm in no position to tell somebody what this means. I think there's a theme that doesn't change in these, but you know, just like the great teachers, I mean, with the Buddha or with Jesus, for example, they speak in metaphor so that whoever was in front of them, whether it was the fishermen or the, you know, the Pharisees, they're going to hear something very, very different. But once they get connected, it becomes a, a, a reality they, they'll never shake. And so at some point, they're going to experience each other's reality because that's just the nature of it. And whether it's in this lifetime or the next. Quick pause mm -hmm. there. You covered so many points there that really need to be pulled apart. But what I want to do here is let's pause for a minute. I want to play an extended clip from this YouTube video that you have up. It's been very successful where we'll receive hundreds of thousands of views and it's really, really well done. And I think it'll bring us back to those points that you just raised. What if the question of the existence of life after life could now be answered with certainty? What if we now know what it looks like, what it feels like, a closer look into what is known as the near-death experience is now giving us just this opportunity. Advances in medicine, particularly more effective resuscitation techniques introduced in the 1960s, has enabled doctors, nurses, and EMTs to bring millions of clinically dead people back to life, something that was not possible before this time. In a state of clinical death, most frequently brought on by cardiac arrest, the respiratory center near the brainstem stops functioning, 
evidenced by the cessation of breathing. Blood flow to the brain stops altogether. There is a complete loss of electrical activity in the cerebral cortex, which results in a flat EEG. All brain functioning ceases, and it becomes impossible to be conscious or to form memories. And yet, it is in just this state of clinical death when people are reporting having the most profound experiences of their lives. With survivors reporting these experiences in such high numbers, and with such clarity and consistency, they are opening a window into another realm of existence we can no longer ignore. Okay, I'll stop it right there. I want to bring up some points. People are going to love or hate that video. What mm -hmm. I love about it, and that's why I've been kind of pounding on this theme, is I love when you say certainty. And uh, I, I would maybe say it back to the hedge fund. It's a tradable event. You know, it's like, right. hey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like it's, uh, gotta gotta make that trade. That's a slam yeah. dunk because yeah, so much of the stuff. Yeah, well, so many of the interviews that I I do and and I love and respect. You know, so many people have different perspectives. I just interviewed Dr. Dean Radin. I, I love Dean Radin. You know, he's the one who's falsified the the crazy soulless your biologic robot consciousness isn't real kind of thing. Oh. But he doesn't get it. He doesn't. He can't cross. The Rubicon. He can't say, well, yeah, it's obvious now, just like you're doing, and just say, well, look, this is what we know. And we know that when the heart stops, the brain goes flatline. People, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Did you see the Michigan study with the rats where there was this burst? And you go, yeah, I saw it still. I'm trading on this, on this thing over here because <laughs> we got 60 years of EEG data with right rats that have died and people that have died and dogs that have died and we know there's no eeg activity you know when this and this happens physiologically but wait a minute what do you what do you mean what about my uh, the new study that just came out did you see that with the gamble and it's like bro uh, what are you trying to do you're just trying to develop something to support your existing belief system i get that that's fine remember uh, walmart called they want you back for the night shift uh by the way <laughs> You can see me. I'll be out on Longboat Key, you know, drinking a martini. You know, it's like it's a worldview kind of thing that just won't allow people to do that. I appreciate that. And I may be being a little bit too flippant, but you, you lay down in very concrete terms what this is about in terms of we kind of had an inkling that this was real because it's been repeated over and over to us by all these different wisdom traditions. And now we have. I love how you put the scientific wrinkle thing, you know, it's, it's a wrinkle. We don't know exactly why it's coming through back to your metaphor thing. I don't know if I, I don't know if it's a metaphor. I don't know if these experiences are being relayed back to us metaphorically. I don't know, but I know that the patterns that you're seeing are undeniable. The data just speaks clearly of them and we have to process them however we process them into our world and decide whether to get up in the morning and live as if the data says make the trade and there is more or to decide not to the trade metaphor i was going to say if if i had the kind of data that i i spent oh my gosh i don't know six months seven months going through these things if i had that kind of data i and I could create a trading program that would be infallible. Like the data was, is that strong. And so, yeah, you have that confidence of, you know, this is what it is, you know, statistical significance, you run these kind of numbers, you know, it, it's way beyond statistically, you know, rel it, it is what it is. I mean, you know, when you get that kind of data, that strong, you know, you, it's now much, much more on, on the person who doesn't, believe it to come up with something. And I don't like to spend so much time on the people that knock it down because I, I wouldn't give them air so much airtime just because they haven't done their research. They essentially say, Hey, you know, this, this isn't true, but it's like, but they haven't done their own perspective or retrospective studies. They haven't, they, they don't, they don't have, um, they don't have, I don't want to say they don't have a leg to stand on, but it's, it's somewhat intellectually, lazy the what they've done and very simple thing well first of all 
and and I won't spend too much time on it because I don't like to, you know, knock it down because to me it's it's not really a conversation. But you won't find these skeptics, and I mean skeptics in a negative way, where they're not open-minded skeptics. Um, they haven't had an NDE, so I mean maybe there are those that exist, but I haven't heard one that has had a, a verified, you know, clinical death that it's verified. The other, you know, simple things like the DMT example that they speak of. I went to uh, Peru a couple of few years ago, and I spent some time with the shaman there and, you know, went through seven ayahuasca ceremonies, which is all about DMT. And I took it at all different types of doses. And uh, I can tell you with great certainty that, that at whatever level you want to talk about is nothing. No, I mean, you can say there are bits and pieces, just like you can say dreams can be interpreted in certain bits and pieces, but, but this is not DMT. And, and as far as dreams go, it's very interesting because Carl Jung had a, a very profound near-death experience. And in his autobiography he says, you know, these, these, the near-death experience is not, a, this is nothing like a dream. This is more real than real. Um, you know, these are things you don't forget when they describe things like time, past, present, and future. Time kind of bends a little bit in, in, a, in an ayahuasca ceremony, but you can't describe it in the same way. You'll remember very profound experiences, but small pieces. And if you look at um, what's really interesting in, in these near-death experiences that I came across, which I've heard about is I never heard of anyone that ran into um, someone that was living. It was always somebody that would, had passed away. They're, that's completely consistent. I mean, across the board. Whereas in, a, in an ayahuasca ceremony, probably more than half the people you experience are in that realm are people that are living and part of your life. And the mythic imagery is very, very different. So there's, there's all that kind of stuff going on. I'm I hear you on one hand. On the other hand, I think I, I, I pull up on that a little bit. You know, I just had a terrific interview with a guy named William Peters, and he's probably one of the most well-known researchers of shared death experience, along with Raymond Moody. Raymond Moody was really the first guy to write about this and talk about it. Again, kudos Raymond Moody, great, great work that he's done. But the shared death experience is truly, truly unique from a scientific or kind of hedge fund trader scientific perspective. It's, it's even more convincing or compelling data because you have living people who right. you know didn't even know each other and were in the room and saw the same thing happen saw the light come down saw the the being saw the person you know like go through a terminal lucidity event you know where they were dead you know and now they come alive and they're dead so there are different ways to to look at this thing yeah oh, yeah the, the 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 tricky thing about it though is that the best that I can tell from this, what we're consistently being confronted with is something you mentioned just kind of in passing, and you definitely mentioned not in passing in the book, you talk about it quite a great, quite a bit, the crossover experience is the book again, realer than real. And if you take realer than real, which is what this experience in the extended consciousness is consistently reported, it kind of offers a tricky catch 22. We're talking about something in this lesser reality. So in a way, we have to be kind of on guard that everything we're saying is less real than the reality. And right. I think that's a, a cautionary tale. I, the, the other thing that I think really comes through in the shared death experience that is also throughout your book is that we don't know what that term metaphorical means. We don't right. know if this experience is being served up uniquely for us, or if it's, as you alluded to, metaphorical across culture, if it's for everyone in our tribe, everyone in our family, everyone in the world, everyone in all the other worlds. We don't know what that necessarily means. And there's, to a certain extent, and this is what I really appreciate what you're helping us break through is those to a certain extent are unanswerable questions. And what you do so beautifully in the book is 
you allow those questions to remain and to come through in the story, but then you also just kind of pull back and go, okay, but let's check this. We do know this, right? We do know that survival is just the reality. We have to accept that or we're just completely kind of whiffing on the data that's right in our face. And that's a very valuable, valuable place to be because as we know, and as you talked about in your life experience, a lot of people can't get there. I mean, you got there, but a lot of people spend their whole life and never get there, are still afraid of death, are still deeply in grief because they're, they're, they can't fundamentally understand this. Or as we see, and I'm much more conspiratorial probably than you are, but people are, you know, driven to kind of very, very unhealthy control and domination things on a massive scale because they don't want to deal with death or they are into some kind of transhumanism kind of thing just as an escape from death. So there's the metaphor thing is tricky and the greater yeah. reality thing is tricky. What do you think about those two things? Well, yeah, the metaphor is tricky and it's really the first thing I stumbled on uh, whatever, 25, 30 years ago when I started to hear Joseph Campbell speak. But when he started speaking, I would say that it was more real than real. It was more real than anything I had heard before because when he started speaking of metaphor and speaking metaphor, it, it, it hit me at such a deep level. And it was that powerful that I, it changed my whole, the whole course of my life. So um, that's metaphor. That's the power of metaphor. The great teachers, the great, you know, religious figures of all, and say, not traditional, you know, institutionalized religion, but people that have had the most sway over time are the ones that are able to communicate at that level because to the receiver, it is more real than real as, as much as we can experience that in this realm because it speaks to them in exactly where they are. But metaphor is tricky because I think we, we don't really, well, I don't think we know how to fully um, articulate it in the West. Like what is a metaphor? How do you even, how do you even know to look for one? You know, when you're watching Star Wars, I mean, Star Wars, George Lucas was friends with Joseph Campbell. In fact, one of the Bill Moyer's episodes in that series was filmed at Skywalker Ranch, which he was a huge fan. And, and that really informed and, and um, inspired a lot of the whole series, Star Wars. Now, when the average person is sitting there watching Star Wars, I remember when I was a kid, the first one came out. I mean, it blew my mind. I, that was the first film like that, but it was also the story. And um, but the average person is like, they don't understand that this is, you know, there's, it's mythic. Okay. Now it's a spaceship instead of the horse, like Parsifal and, you know, quest for the grail, but these heroes journey. Mythic. Exactly. So we don't appreciate it. We don't, we don't know how to tell story there. You know, we don't, um, we don't, you look at these cultures that have been able to hold together and it's because they have community and oftentimes it's also that they respect the elders who have seen it. You know, it's like when you look at the markets, if you try and create a program based on what happens, you know, over the last six months, you're in trouble. You have to go back 50 years, 100 years, then see these patterns. And then it's like, ah, I see, you know, you look at things from 60,000 feet and they look very, very different than when you're in the weeds. And I think that's what, in one sense, also metaphor allows you to do is to, to experience, uh, you know, a concept, a story that, you know, it, it, it hits you at your core. It sneaks past your defenses. You don't know how to stop it. That's what happens also with humor. That's what I love about satire. You know, some of these shows like The Daily Show, the, the, um, I'm going to go off on a tangent, but that, that the average person watching The Daily Show back in the day with Jon Stewart were more informed than people that were watching CNN, MSNBC, Fox News. And it's because that humor, it like opens people up and the truth can get in and they feel it, they get it, they sense it. And the same thing happens obviously with metaphor. So I think it's massively important, but 
you know, we're in a culture that it's just noise everywhere. It's noise and everything has been broken down into such little bites, you know, and the spinning the phone and small images and everything's getting shattered and broken. So there's uh, no uh, Twas ever thus. What, a, I mean, Bill Moyers, I mean, we'll, we'll jump right back into my other world. Bill Moyers, what was his job? Ooh, press secretary for LBJ. Hmm. Yeah. What role did he play in JFK thing? Hmm. Interesting. Why is he on his hero's journey? Maybe to make amends for some of the stuff that he did? I don't know, just speculating. But right. this is this is all over the place. And I think it's particularly important because that's what I was one embracing about what you're saying, but also pushing back on what you're saying. I think there's a bunch of people that want to exploit the metaphorical reality of everything and shape it into their narrative. Like, oh, yeah. oh you know, this is the metaphor for what's going on right now. And you know, we're, we're in the, the other thing, I guess, and well, <laughs> I get excited. I talk. So, and I think that also relates to this whole question of how much is our narrative being controlled and served up to us in a way that we can look back at history and go, oh my gosh, yeah, we really were told a story. We were really sold a narrative. We were sold a myth. Our One of our great myths in our country is life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. That's an awesome, awesome myth. But those guys that signed that document were enslaving in the most unbelievably inhumane way millions and millions of people and they found a way to make that kind of fit inside their world and then they enslaved him and killed him and murdered him and raped him and did all this stuff for a couple hundred years then they gave him a couple years off and then they did it for another hundred years and that is our reality i'm not saying i hold any guilt or i'm just kind of stepping back and saying look at that pattern that is but is it not true that our story, our metaphor, our narrative is still a powerful, powerful narrative because our inalienable rights are truly our rights. They always were. And whether they're written on a piece of paper or whether they're not written on a piece of paper, that's what makes them what they are. So I think this thing about narrative is super tricky and we're certainly living in a time that a lot of people are trying to control that narrative. But the one question I have for you, and I guess it would also be kind of a skeptical moment with the book is, do you think we're living in a special time? Because when we talk about the medical link with near-death experience and how there seem to be so many more reported now, and maybe that's because we've learned to bring people back through resuscitation, it all points to this, we are living in a special time. I'm not, my tone suggests that I'm totally dismissing that. I don't want to be totally dismissive of it, but I don't want to treat it as a fundamental, unquestionable truth. What do you think about, what do you think about that, DJ? You know, I, <clears throat> I'm also extremely skeptical. I know that so often people think they're living, you know, in the most interesting inflection moment, something's going to happen. I, I believe it because certain things have happened, especially recently, literally last year, which, which I'll mention in a minute, but also because when I look at, again, the markets, the markets go in patterns and some of them are macro patterns that, that take about 70 years and they continue to happen every 70 years, you can go back in time to the Renaissance and these types of things. But now with the markets, we can actually quantify this. We never had a, how do you quantify this, you know, hundreds of years ago, but over the last 150 plus years, we have these, these patterns that are, um, that measure human emotion and you find them in the charts. And one of these patterns, these super patterns that you see in the markets is coming to a head. And I will say, as somebody who's watched every tick of the market for 36 years, that I've never seen anything like what I've seen in the markets that's happening right now. And, you know, there's, there's good and bad to that. One is that I think we're going to see an, an epic collapse in, in the economic system globally. 
And, and, you know, that's a whole show in itself, but it's, you know, you can't convince me otherwise because I just know the stuff from in my bones. Cause I've, I've lived it for so long, but the, there's so many things that are happening right now, cross currents and, you know, with currencies and, and uh, you know, what the fed has done with interest rates and how, I mean, we've bought, we've basically painted ourselves into a corner and we've kicked the can down the road too far. It's over. So it's, we're, we're like the coyote that's now going over the edge and doesn't realize there's nothing there anymore. There's no legs under this market. It's, uh, it's over. So I think that's happening. If you want to talk about a sign that has changed now, and, and I'm not, a, I've always felt, I mean, you have, again, statistically, you want to tell me that there's no, you know, intelligent life in the universe. Good luck convincing me that. Well, you know, there have been signs for a very long time and I was, you know, I've always been interested and I always believed it, but the government, the defense department came out, what was it, seven months ago and laid out, you know, there was a, there was a, a very in-depth article by a very reputable woman who, um, who got a hold of footage from the, uh, from, from people that were on the, you know, the Navy carriers, fighter pilots, et cetera. I'm sure everybody's kind of seen this or heard about it, whether they it's really registered is hard to say, but okay. So there are literally UFOs flying around on the planet here now. And, and I think to myself, you know, there are two stories that are mind blowing that could be happening. One would be the near death experience. I would see the other is, is, is life from another, you know, planet or dimension or wherever they're coming from, but they're here right now. And what blows my mind is nobody really made much of it. It came and it went. And so I see some of the signs and, you know, just the way things are feeling. I mean, people probably feel things now that there's something is not right. Something is not working in this whole COVID thing and how that's, you know, changing so much of, you know, how, we interact with each other and, and the surveillance society and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. But DJ, I mean, we just don't know how much of that is engineered and yeah. the impending economic collapse. We don't know. A lot of people would point to that being one of the goals of the current project. Right. And you could even tie it if you really wanted to go there to this larger world global thing, you know, from a, interplanetary perspective does it really make sense to have 146 different actors on the stage doing that or do you somehow want to bring all those together that's kind of putting a positive spin on the new world order globalization but even take the ufo thing it is extremely extremely complicated and when you talk about controlling the narrative i mean like i take what you just say and go yeah but dj but the real story here is they've been lying their freaking ass off for 70 years. And not only that, but they've been threatening, killing, probably, we can't totally prove it, but definitely threatening, terrorizing, driving people crazy, getting people to sign, you know, you death, death wish non-disclosure agreements. And only some of these guys have come out, these longtime 30-year Air Force guys have come out and said, yeah, I was at the nuclear silo. This is what happened. The ET came, UFO, turned on all 10. Yeah. Turned on all 10 right. of the missiles. Each one are independent because they have to be independent. That's like they have their right. own power source, their independent control mechanism. There's supposed to be no way, because otherwise, you know, anyone could fly over with a... EME or a cosmic rays from the sun could shut them out. No, we've we thought about that. This is our, they turned them all on. Then you go over to the Ukraine and back when Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union and the wars that so we don't know any of this, but the wall comes down, we get the they, oh yeah, that happened over here too. But when right. ET UFO flew over, he turned them all on. Yeah. And we were like 15 seconds before launch and right. then turned them off. But then when right. you talk to the real top dog like Robert Hastings, who I did an email interview with, who's studied this more thoroughly than anyone else and completely puts to rest any people who are uncomfortable. UFOs, oh, it's government or it's this. No, it's been like this. This UFO connection is the overwhelming evidence that this is real, along with the cross-culture, cross-time thing, you know, like I interviewed Artie Six Killer Clark. But here's the point, and I've never made this point. Uh, on, on the show, I want to, and here's an opportunity. 
when you listen really carefully to what Robert Hastings says, he has changed his interpretation, the narrative of that. What he used to say is, E.T. was doing a shot across the bow. E.T. was saying, look, these nuclear weapons you're playing with, be careful. You could destroy this planet. But you know what he says now? He says, yeah, that maybe, but maybe it's in, it's of a mutual interest. Maybe it isn't this big brother, God in the sky, E.T. wants to protect us. Maybe he's like, Bro, you know, I got a stake in this game that you don't quite understand, so keep those things under wrap. There are so many different ways to interpret this, but the one way we cannot interpret it is the narrative we're, we're being given by the people who released. And I've had both of mine, the people who wrote the article in the New York Times, uh, Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal have both been on the show, have both done interviews, and I'm like, Come on, you got to be kidding. This uh, professional counterintelligence agent, Lou Elizondo, uh, translate as professional liar for the government. Uh, what, not that we, we need, you know, professional liars in the government. That's what spies do. But we're supposed to believe him after 70 years of completely lying about this. We're supposed to be believe him in that these that none of this was classified. That's why he's not behind jail because everyone else even takes a photo of inside the submarine and the kid, you know, inadvertently, there's something in the background. He's in jail, he's in the brig, you know, but Lou Elizondo's out doing interviews. And you know what his, his message is? Protect our airspace. This is an issue of national security. I mean, this is such a concocted, crafted kind of spin of, ET's here, and you know what you need to worry about is protecting our airspace. How does that make any sense to people? So I got a theory on that, actually. You know, when, when you look at things like, I'll draw a parallel here. If you look at the way now we're, we're seeing the introduction of psychedelics for psychological healing, particularly PTSD, these types of things they, they started using for veterans of the Iraq war who were coming back, you know, basket cases. And they started to show unbelievable results using that in therapy and talk therapy, integration, et cetera. Once that happened and they were able to essentially prove it, that it helped the veterans, they had to start giving it to the veterans. And then these people, I forget his name, any, I forget his name, but they've been trying to get essentially what the government's doing now with the veterans. They, they were trying, they've been trying for 20 years to be able to do this. And as soon as it became, you know, viable for, for them to do it for the veterans, all of a sudden we're starting to hear, you know, that, that this is coming now. It started everywhere. And it's because of that. So when you start, in my opinion, when you start, I think Lou Elizondo knows that, you know, there, there's no way that that these people can continue to say in government, hey, man, this thing, you know, we can't tell you or it doesn't exist or whatever. But the minute you say this is a matter of national security, that these things could blow up our ships. Now, all these senators can't be they can't piss it away and say, wow, you know, it's like, dude, do you understand they're flying over our ships? We have it on our radar. They're, they're flying circles around us. They're a danger in our airspace. They're worse, they're worse than the Russians. Now, these senators that always have to act like hawks, they, they're like, hey, you know what? We're going to have to put some money. That's my, my feeling is he's using that whole military system against itself to be able to put it on the map and say, if you don't do this, you're putting our troops at risk. But he's no an agent. He's an agent. He's an intel agent. The only thing that matters is the truth. It's back to the militant agnostic. Oh, the Alexa, off. Oh, that alerts me of a potential trading signal. Oh, <laughs> cool. Okay. Trade. Okay. I, I don't want like I don't. Clock, so don't worry about it. Oh, okay. Okay. So, you know, I had uh, Richard Dolan on the show and I, I really respect Richard Dolan a lot. He's probably one of the, one of the most reliable UFO researchers we've had. He, he's published amazing books and he kind of takes us this long-term historical perspective on it. He wrote a book a few years ago called After Disclosure and his point, and it was brilliant at the time, it turned out to be totally not true, was, hey, there will never be disclosure because the questions will never stop. Well, 
we've had disclosure and the questions never even started. Exactly. We just we just took exactly what they said. Oh, what is Lou? What did what did you say, Lou? Oh, it's protect our okay. What about Richard Doty, intelligence officer that tortured Paul Benowitz into going crazy with this orchestrated misinformation, disinformation campaign that was so diabolical that, you know, you can't, when I had Colonel John Alexander on the show, he said, if that's true, then that guy should be in Leavenworth. Yeah, he should be in Leavenworth. We shouldn't allow our military intelligence officers to run operations on American citizens unknowingly because they're trying to protect and trying to do, uh, uh, the only thing that, uh, Paul Benowitz did is he said, Hey guys, I, I see the, the lights out on uh, Kirkland and I just want you to be aware of it, you know? So, and then they have this whole cover story, which is totally fake. Like this is so deep into the UFO thing. Like two people are going to understand this. The cover story that they do, the Mirage Man a video movie that they make says, Oh, well, you know what, what they were really trying to do is hide the, laser and the advanced stealth bomber bullshit what they were doing is ufo shit either theirs or ours but the other thing that they never reveal is that kirkland has nukes which they didn't tell anybody but now we know after the fact kirkland had nukes there so this story of deceit of lie of misinformation disinformation has always been in play so the only way to understand lou elizondo is through that lens and right. the, the way to the, the no one asks those questions like you're a part of that organization what do you think of richard doty should he be in jail? Should he have gone to jail? You know, or he says, like Lou Elizondo says, you know, it's not my fault. Uh, my superiors told me to do that. Who are your superiors? Let's bring them out, you know, to whatever extent the, the who you said you fought to make these disclass declassified. Who classified them when, you know, I mean, it's just so paper yes, thin. It goes, yeah, it's a dark, I think that, you know, I think one of the reasons why there's changes, you know, we're at that inflection point is that in, in so many areas, they're, they're losing control of the narrative. And, you know, I think a lot of that, I think that the, the, po the positive thing in social media is, you know, like if you look at what's going on, the people in Russia, they're getting enough information th through that some of the people, you know, really do understand what's happening because they're the, mis the, the misinformation is insane. But they, they really now run the risk of, um, you know, of, of some type of internal uprising. I mean, they'll knock it down. It'll get ugly. But the same thing is happening in China. So a lot of these, at the same time, there's so much noise and they're putting so much disinformation inside of all of that information that people are confused. And so nobody knows what the hell is going on. But they're losing control of the, of the narrative, but the best thing they can do is just to confuse the shit out of everybody. And I think that's so much of what's going on. I think they just don't want people to know what the hell's going on, whether right or wrong. It's just noise. It's become noise. And so, you know. You see, and, and that's super interesting to me in a way. It's, it's really, really relevant to this conversation in a way that a lot of people don't see or... <laughs> Of course they don't, because I have my own unique interpretation of it. But that is that what the near-death experience is really about is bringing us to the edge of the chasm. And then we have to choose to jump over or not jump over. And the chasm turns out to be just barely a footstep. It's like so easy to jump over. But a lot of people look down and to them, it looks like the Grand Canyon and they can't jump over it. And the jump over point is are you more? Are you more? Are you more than a biologic robot in meaningless universe? Are you connected to the light? Is there a hierarchy of consciousness? Is there right and wrong? You knew that when you were five years old and you put that piece of candy in your pocket at the, at the corner store. Of course you know that to be true. Anything that makes you question that, anything that makes you question oh no, I don't have to worry about that because I'm at a special time or the narrative is this way, that way. No, it's really pretty easy. Just choose the light. Keep choosing the light over and over again. What your book, The Crossover Experience does is give us more and more reasons to 
be confident in that, to make that a highly actionable event to say, is this science actionable? And for you to hold it and go, yep, I can step over. I am more, I am greater. And I feel confident in making that decision. That's what I think it's all about to me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I could, I could imagine if somebody handed me that book after, you know, my son had passed, like right after it, man, that would have helped me a lot. And that's why I created this. It's, you know, the, the things that I've done, like when I was I did the film on racism, it was something I was struggling with personally. And it helped me to kind of crystallize what I really believed. And then it's like, I want to give it out there. There are the answers. I don't like giving the answers. And that's not what's being done in you know, crossover, I think it's in learning to ask the right questions or not necessarily that are there any right questions, but ask questions and to give them some context within which to ask them, because the answers are going to be different for everybody. No, you know, not that one's right and one's wrong, but how we perceive things, how we understand things, how things uh, penetrate, um, you know, at whatever level they're going to penetrate at us based on, you know, where we are and how open we are. So that's what I think is important about something like this um, to, you know, th that's the whole thing I've been trying to do is challenge, provoke and inspire. But you really got to push somebody into an uncomfortable place, I think, to get them to be like, you know, hey, but but never push on them an answer. Just say, man, just take a look. You've got to ask questions, especially now. I mean, how the hell do you know you if you watch Fox News and MSNBC? You're living on two different planets. You know, it's just like in the markets, the financial markets. You got the guy from Goldman saying this is the greatest buying opportunity of all time. And then you got a guy over at JP Morgan saying that, you know, these markets are, are going to crash. These are both, you know, MBA, PhDs, top of their field. How the what are they looking at? They're looking at the same numbers for the most part. You know, so that's it. You've got to ask questions. You can't follow this guy or that guy, because you know, because one of these guys is going over the let, you know. But he's incredibly confident. You have to be open. You have to be flexible, pliable. You got to ask a lot of questions, and then just be willing to to be. I think you have to be willing to to look stupid sometimes. You know that's not easy to do, and you have to learn how to be okay with getting your head handed to you. Whether it's in the markets, I started up a jazz club once, and I got my head handed to me. It was a really cool jazz club and the whole thing, and I. But I didn't realize I didn't I couldn't handle being around that many people that wanted to like talk to me crowds. So the place collapsed and it was like embarrassing because I'd always had success in business. But it's like, man, I learned more from that. You know, we learn more from our failures, from our successes. There's no question. So the whole thing is just ask questions, be willing to take risks, not stupid risks. But, you know, what you might consider a risk, you know, the downside is is can be will be pure upside whatever happens one way or the other but you gotta you know you gotta put throw yourself into the deep end you know you cannot if you sit in the in the surf you're gonna get the shit kicked out of you you gotta go into the deep end and just you know Richard Rohr had a great saying I actually just finished a, another book I had to do the book at the same time as this one because the research was driving me insane it was so dry it was so um it just got monotonous because you're just going not. So I started writing a book and, and my son, Sean had asked me that he, I'd written something and he's like, man, you got to turn this into the book. But the end of the book, uh, there's this great saying and it's from Richard Rohr. He was in one of my films and it was based on a poem. Um, but he said that um, basically the metaphor was you have to learn to breathe underwater. And that's why you have to jump into the deep end. You have to just let go and just, Give your body as a coral castle and learn how to breathe underwater. And I think that's kind of what it is because you just, you know, you got to ask questions. You just got to let go. I have a hard time, <laughs> a little bit easier now, but man, that's not easy for, for a, skept a skeptics. It's your best and worst enemy, you know, but I think it's, in, in, you have to have that, the yin and the yang, you know, it's the struggle. If you don't struggle with your own self, you know, you're, you're asleep. You know, and you can't be asleep anymore in this day and age, you know, <laughs> you can't. So anyway, that's my theory. Awesome, man. That's a great way to end it. So DJ, where do you plan on going with this? Uh, the crossover experience, you have a new book out. Where are your projects taking you in the future? I don't know that I can do another book. These, 
these were really hard. You know, I found film work easier, um, but I don't feel like film right now. And, and I, th I think one of the things I need to do, because it's been a, a really difficult kind of two years. And just now, as I've launched it, um, I started to listen to jazz again. You know, my wife comes home. She goes, oh, my God, I'm so happy to hear you now. She doesn't love the music, but she's like, you know. And it, it, the, something about music, but especially jazz. I grew up on jazz, um, which none of my friends listened to or liked. I don't know anything like rock and roll. But so I'm, I'm looking at opening another jazz club. So that puts, you know, that's a typical DJ move. You know, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I also have, I want, I'm going to go down to Peru again, I think, and, and kind of do that scene. And years ago, I went out to the desert kind of sit on a rock for, you know, I was going to do 40 days and 40 nights and I got physically got the shit kicked out of me. It was like a, like a crazy desert in the United States. So I've always got something, but, you know, I think I might go into where I, where I, my greatest Waterloo, I call it was, was my jazz club. It was an amazing club, but I couldn't handle being there. I always say I love building it, but I never, um, I never accounted for the fact that human beings were going to come in, in, in large numbers. <laughs> and as soon as they did, I literally, my friend said, dude, you're crazy. They'll think you're crazy. Close it right now. And I almost did like literally the week it opened. So I just like, can't do this, man. But I did it. And that was a mistake. So now I'm thinking, of going back to my Waterloo and, you know, giving it another shot. I miss the music. You know, I really miss that. So, but I don't know about another book. I'll send you the one that, that I'm finishing. It's I, actually, it's called Punching Waves. Um, Cause you know, if you read it, you know, the life has been kind of crazy, but that was good. Very cathartic. But I think now it's time to listen to some jazz and relax a little bit. DJ, I really hope people check out the book again, the crossover experience. It's been great having you on Skeptico. Thanks for joining me. Thank you so much. And one thing I want to do uh, is really thank Jeffrey Long at NDERF. Anybody that uh, wants to really learn about, you know, really go through these, you know, you don't have to go through thousands of them, but you can really search through them and get such a great sense of what's happening there. And, and if they want to, the crossover website, I've created that as kind of a hub where you'll find research reports, scientific reports. I have playlists of what I would consider some of the top testimonials, uh, links to IANDS, all of the different NDERF sites. So it, it really focuses on just NDEs, but that's at crossoverexperience.com. And, and for whoever buys the book, which is also interesting, if it's the ebook at the back where the, where the notes are, the bibliography, those are all live links directly to the testimonials that what I pulled out of the testimonials came from. So you can go directly to all the testimonials I worked with. So that's just, you know, something that might help people. Thanks again to DJ Kadajian for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I'd tee up from this interview is, how do you find clarity in these biggest, most important questions about how to live your life? How do you choose? Let me know. Love to hear from you. Lots more to come on Skeptico. Stick around. Until next time. Take care and bye for now.